in this video, let's go ahead and start implementing the first REST endpoint. And let's start with the one that gives us the list of all the banks. Now, there are two general ways that we can approach this. We can either go top down, so starting at the REST endpoint, and then basically working our way down through all the layers until we have all the functionality that we need in order to return the list of banks. Now, on the other hand, we can also do it bottom up. So here we would first think about the kind of data that we need and then build our way up all the way to the REST API, so to the controller level. For this first endpoint, let's go bottom up because this will first of all allow more self-contained videos going uh, each step. And also it allows us to do better unit testing of each single step. So at each layer basically, or for each video, for each step, uh, you can have the unit tests for that specific level, which is a bit um, harder to do if you go uh, top down. So let's go ahead into our source main Kotlin folder. And in here, let's create a new package and we're gonna call this one model. So as you might know, the term model, which comes from the model view controller architecture pattern, it simply refers to the data representations of your application. And since we're going bottom up now, in this video, we're just gonna create the data layer for application. So we're gonna create the model. And since we're talking about bank objects, we need a class that represents our banks. So inside this new package, let's go ahead and create a new Kotlin class or file. And I'm simply gonna call this one bank. Now this bank class here will basically be our data transfer object. So a data transfer object is called data transfer object because it's the one that goes over the network. So for instance, if a user requests some data from your REST API, you're gonna respond with usually some JSON data or XML data. And it's really just this bank class uh, that's being serialized into a JSON representation and also the same way if someone makes a request and in the request body, they provide a JSON or some JSON data for you to process. Now we're gonna see this in action later on. For now, let's go ahead and create this bank class. Now inside this class, we want some kind of data that represents the bank. Uh, for this, let's actually go ahead to the uh, New Boston website over here. And then under get started, let's look at the documentation. And here on the bank API, let's see what the bank endpoint looks like in the real network of the digital currency. And then we're gonna use a simplified representation. So here you can see this is what a bank object really looks like in the new Boston uh, digital currency. For our simple example, let's just use a account number, a transaction fee and a trust. So let's go ahead and represent this in our class. Now, if you do already know some Kotlin, please bear with me here. I wanna show how you would traditionally go and create such a class. And then I'm gonna go and refactor that step by step until we reach really clean Kotlin code that also shows you one of the super useful features of the Kotlin language and just shows you how concise it can be. For now, let's do it the same way you would basically do it in Java. So we're gonna create these uh, fields in the class. So we have an account number, which is a string. Uh, we also said we want a trust. This can be a double. And then a transaction fee, which is actually an int. And then we're gonna create a constructor down here. So in Kotlin, you just say constructor. And the constructor takes an account number of type string, the trust of type double, and a transaction fee. And again, if you already know Kotlin, bear with me here. Uh, I know we're gonna do this a lot simpler later on. So we have transaction fee, and I'm gonna reorder this in a second to be um, more consistent. So let's just do it like this for now, then it's all consistent. Now, the next thing you would do in languages like uh, Java is you would have a getter and setter for each field. So let's just do it for the account number for now. Um, so this would return a string. Let me at least write it a bit shorter in Kotlin again, using this notation over here. 
and you would have a set account number which takes in an account number of course of type string and all it does is, is, is it overrides the account number. Now in order to be able to do this I'll actually have to make this a var. So if you write val in Kotlin that's like a final variable in Java. So instead I'll have to make this a var which allows me to reassign this variable later on. Now imagine the same getter and setter for trust and transaction fee. And then also we have things like equals and hash code, we can generate them. And also we want a to string, so we're going to generate that as well, just like you would do in Java. All right, so we have quite a lot of code, even though I already removed the other getters and setters. Now let's go ahead and refactor this and move it to Kotlin style. Now the first thing we can do actually independent of whether it's Kotlin or Java is I don't really want a setter, I want these to be uh, final. So I'm gonna pull this back again. So you should always strive to have immutable classes where you cannot just override any field at any point. So once I create a bank object, I want it to always contain the same account number, trust and transaction fee. And of course, this would be the same in any programming language. But now for this getter over here, um, Kotlin actually has a specific syntax for that. So below this class property here, you can write get and also you can write set to create a setter. Now get should simply return the backing field. So this backing field is the kind of hidden field that really powers this property over here. So this is the one that stores the actual account number and you can only access this field in the getter or setter. So if you were to add a setter here as well, you get a value and typically you would just set the backing field to the value. Of course, that's not possible here because I have a val, so it doesn't have a setter, it's a final variable. And also we have a naming clash here. So if I look at why it's showing these red lines, you can see platform declaration clash. The following declarations have the same JVM signature. So you can see that this getter over here, it will generate a Java bytecode function which is also called get account number and we already have a get account number down here and this is why the two declarations will clash. So instead of having this separate getter here in Kotlin you would do it like this. So so much for getters and setters in Kotlin now let's actually go ahead and refactor this. And just for fun let's actually just use the recommendations from IntelliJ. So it's showing some gray squiggly lines here because the getter is redundant because just getting the value of the backing field is just the default implementation. So you don't need to do this because by default, if you have a val, Kotlin will already generate the default getter for you. The same if you have a var, it's also gonna generate the default setter for you. Only if you wanna perform some custom logic, then you can override the get and set methods. Now next let's go ahead and see why it's showing the constructor in yellow. And let's convert this to a primary constructor. So in Kotlin most of the time you use primary constructors. And this means you define the constructor parameters up here right inside the class header instead of having secondary constructors. You can still have more constructors by putting them here. Um, but oftentimes you just need one and then you can do it right inside the class header. So now you can see it actually already refactored all the fields. So if I go back for a second, you can see it also moved all the fields. So all this code, it just moved into this other, whoops, it just moved into a primary constructor. All right, so let me put this also on separate lines again. Now there's one thing we should change here. I made these private initially because I wanted to show the way it's done in Java with the private field and then the public getter. But since in Kotlin, those two are basically uh, both represented by this property, we really want this account number, trust and transaction feed to be public. And by default in Kotlin, the classes and its properties are public. So we don't really need to have the modifier here it's also gonna tell you that it's redundant. So what this means now 
if this account number here is public, it just means that Kotlin exposes those default getters and setters publicly. It doesn't mean that the backing field is in any way uh, exposed to the outside. So you still have information hiding. Um, it's really just the getters and setters that are not explicitly shown here, but that still exist for this property. All right, so far so good. So now we're left with a class that has three properties, but we still have these equals hash code and two string implementations that are really quite dumb and that you just generate with your IDE. So what we can do in Kotlin instead is we can declare a data class. And a data class has quite a few useful and convenient features. And some of them include that it automatically creates a standard implementation of equals, of hash code, and of toString. So we don't need all of those. We can just remove all of them. And now we're left with a data class that really just represents what we initially wanted to do. We just wanted to have a data transfer object or a data class that has three fields, an account number, a trust, and a transaction fee. So with this, we have really perfectly expressed what we actually wanted. And this is also the way you would do this normally in Kotlin. So I really love this feature. I love Kotlin. And this is just one of the reasons why. Uh, if you want to learn more about Kotlin, check out the links below for my uh, YouTube videos and also courses. For now, this is all we need. Now, I should mention that in Java 14, they introduced a feature called records. And in Java 14, it's a preview feature, I believe. But then in Java 15, it's just a regular feature. And records are basically the same thing. So Java is also catching up and really improving some of those uh, boilerplate that have been necessary before. Um, so yeah, but that's basically the end result of this video. <laughs> so just five lines of code. Um, I hope you're not disappointed because of this, rather the opposite, because we were able to remove around 40 lines of code um, and just really reducing it to what's necessary. Also, we don't really need any tests in this video because we don't really want to test the programming language that we're using. So there's no point in testing if the data class works as it should. Um, so it's always the question, what are you trying to test? We could test that we really have these three properties, but I'm not convinced that this is really a useful test. Um, if you have a different opinion, let me know in the comments below. But for now, we're going to move on. We have our data layer already. So let's move on up the chain until we reach the rest endpoint. Just to quickly recap, in this video, you already learned a few essential features of Kotlin, such as val versus var, where val is basically a final variable or property. You also learned about class properties, which are kind of like fields together with their getter, and if they're mutable, they're a setter. And then you learned a bit about um, primary constructors and secondary constructors, where typically you will only need primary constructors. And obviously you learned about data classes, which give you things like hash code equals to string for free. They also give you a copy method and a few other things. So they're super useful, especially for DTOs, data layers, um, and are a really essential feature you would use every day. Now, on top of that, you also learned a little bit about top-down versus bottom-up structuring of your code. So I hope this was useful to you, and I'll see you again in the next one.